Thank you. Applause to see if I'm worthy of it at the end. Uh, I want to thank Robert and Peter for the invitation. I want to thank Dale, as usual, for his assistance. Um, this is a subject that uh, isn't a very cheerful one, I'm afraid. Uh, and the tone, I have to warn you, is going to be somber. Uh, if this were a political rally, uh, I guess I would be obliged at the end to give us a glimmer of hope and to suggest some direction we can move on. I don't know that there is. Uh, 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 a real hopeful resolution of the current situation we're in vis-a-vis -vis the uh, worsening relationships between the world's two major nuclear powers. Uh, and I don't know uh, what I would even advocate people to do. Uh, being informed and, and informing others, of course, is an obligation. In the long run, how successful that will be, we'll find out. Uh, the title is, is rather wordy, as you, of the talk, as, as you can see. And, uh, but I felt obliged first of all to address uh, either three distinct but interrelated topics or three aspects of one topic. I prefer the second interpretation. I think what we're talking about is one phenomenon. It has an international perspective, it has a bilateral um, uh, dynamic between the US and Russia, and it most certainly has a lingering and I'm afraid of anything intensifying domestic component, which is to say this. Uh, that the Russophobia, the anti-Russian hysteria, there is no other war, uh, uh, expression for it, to be quite frank. Uh, if you've seen even in recent days, or after uh, Tulsi Gabbard and uh, the second round of the Democratic presidential candidates' debates, uh, you know, managed to uh, critique uh, Kamala Harris fairly successfully. Uh, Harris's uh, press aide the very next day, I believe, or shortly thereafter, uh, basically refer to uh, Russian bots and Tulsi Gabbard's words being either um, provided to her by the Russians or exploited by the Russians. And I, I want to put, uh, you know, capital the in the Russians because unlike the Cold War, and I'm looking at uh, our audience, all of us have lived through the Cold War. Uh, we know that what we're seeing is, is not really new, it's something that's been rebranded and uh, intensified and exacerbated. That, uh, to be, be precise, for 102 years, there's been an undercurrent of Russophobia. Uh, it may, may have been, from 1917 onwards, the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. It may have been anti-communist on the surface, but it was decidedly Russophobia underneath. And I'm afraid it's that component of the Cold War um, uh, campaign or crusade uh, that has sunk in deeply into the collective psyche or, or subconscious of uh, people in most of the West, in the United States in particular. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to eradicate. What I, I believe we've seen over the last three years, and I want to stress in my opinion that I think this simply coincides with the Trump phenomenon rather than being inextricably connected with it. Um, and I would even suggest at some point that I believe that uh, Trump's lack of popularity with half the population uh, is being exploited to exacerbate uh, uh, contentions with Russia as much as Russophobia is being used to tarnish Trump and his administration. And I'll, I'll address that issue in a moment. But three things are occurring simultaneously, and I think the chronology is very important. If uh, the uh, accusing everyone and his brother and sister of being a Russian asset, winning or otherwise, uh, was uh, uh, directly correlated with, with the Trump uh, campaign of three years ago and his administration subsequently, then uh, the other issues, the intensification of anti-Russian sentiment and, as I address as a third uh, you know, factor in this discussion, the uh, historically uh, unprecedented and dangerous breakdown of, of really 50 to 60 years of missile treaties and nuclear weapons treaties that, all, that uh, the Russophobia really begins in earnest on or about uh, 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 the time that Vladimir Putin, it seems the um, uh, eternal head of state of Russia, uh, made what I consider to be a comparatively innocuous speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, where, as I recollect, he doesn't even mention the United States by name, but he talks about the dangers of a uniform world order and such like. He seems never to have been forgiven for those comments, is comparatively uh, mild, I believe, as they were. Uh, of course, at that time, because the political um, landscape was a little bit different, he was immediately attacked by the John McCains of the world, 
uh, we have now seen arguably a reversal in terms of the U.S. two-party system, where the Russophobia, which had been most pronounced amongst Republicans, has now shifted uh, almost entirely uh, to the Democratic Party. So we've seen an intensification of anti, uh, uh, exacerbation of U.S.-Russian relations pretty steadily for the last 12 years, and and I would. Um, I would say that this has been much like the Cold War, you know, the bipolar world with the U.S. and the Soviet Union, where uh, this conflict was fought out uh, in proxy situations. So it would be everything from uh, the coup d'etat in Venezuela, you know, early in the century, to uh, you know, threats of war against Iran. Uh, they're all coming back to the surface again now. Uh, the, uh, 11 years ago, almost to the day, the four-day war in the South Caucasus between Russia and Georgia. There have been a series of these proxy conflicts where uh, states allied to Russia, Venezuela, Iran, South Ossetia, uh, and so forth, have been uh, uh, under pressure from the United States. And uh, you've, you've seen an indirect conflict, again, evocative of the, the Cold War period, where as often as not, uh, American Bush wars were fought to uh, ostensibly uh, to ward off uh, Soviet influence. Uh, much more so than Chinese, by the way, uh, we have to recollect during the Cold War, particularly since the rapprochement between Mao Zedong and Nixon, Kissinger and Zhou Enlai in 1972. It was never Chinese influence we were fighting, it was Soviet influence we were fighting. Um, we all, are, again, are old enough to recollect the peculiar terminology that was used by the United States during the Cold War where the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, comprised of 15 different ethnic uh, uh, federal republics, and literally dozens of not scores of autonomous ethnic republics, was inevitably referred to as Russia. Yeah? Um, now, uh, when uh, those 15 federal republics all are independent nations, and there actually is a Russia, uh, uh, strictly, uh, we're seeing a um, resurfacing of Soviet-era uh, terminology to describe Russia. Um, as often as not, you'll hear uh, TV news anchors, particularly on the, uh, the cable stations, slip up and use terms like Soviet. Uh, it's not unusual to this day to hear people refer to uh, the KGB, which has not existed for 18, or 28 years. Um, Recently, I mean, this is, and there's going to be some humor, um, I would hope, because of the sheer absurdity of some of the things I'm going to be repeating. Uh, but if it's humorous, it's in the sense of the words attributed to Voltaire that uh, God is the director of a comedy in which we dare not laugh. Uh, because uh, absurd or surreal as it may be, it's not really a brute, it's not very funny. So, what we have is in recent days, Mitch McConnell now has, has acquired the moniker Moscow Mitch. Lindsey Graham, of all people, has been referred to, uh, you know, on social media as Leningrad Lindsey. I mean, this is one of the, the worst war hawks, one of the most uh, decidedly and uh, vehemently anti-Russian uh, characters at that. Uh, as soon as he says something that offends, uh, you know, the Democratic Party and its allies now becomes a Russian agent. Uh, I want to, first of all, because I don't, arrogate to myself you know, any uh, pretty information that isn't available from a number of very insightful and courageous uh, people who have spoken out on this issue. I'm going to mention just, uh, this is not a, a completely inclusive list, but I think it hits most of the important people. Uh, Max Blumenthal, Stephen Cohen, Noam Chomsky, Jimmy Dora, the comedian in Chicago, I recommend strongly, uh, Glenn Greenwald at The Intercept, Diana Johnstone, and Dale and I were speaking Daniel Azair at uh, Consortium News, Stephen Lenman in Chicago, Aaron Maté, uh, young and as good as they get, Ray McGovern from Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, uh, Tim Poole from Chicago, uh, a content creator on YouTube, David Stockman, uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, former budget director, he's changed a lot in the interim, uh, Matt Taibbi at Rolling Stone, and Michael Tracy, amongst others who have been uh, as I say, very bold and very courageous on this. I'm sure they've lost a lot of friends. I'm sure they've received a lot of threats because this is such a, uh, an inflammatory and sensitive issue. Uh, uh, in terms of the villains, uh, we're not only talking about the leadership of the Democratic Party. Uh, we're talking about the never-Trumpers uh, 
you know, within the Republican Party, the late and thoroughly unlamented John McCain, uh, you know, the Bush family, and, and others who, uh, you know, never abandoned their Russophobia because uh, they had no opportunist reason to do so. I mean, I think we're safe in assuming uh, that the majority of Republicans who have abandoned their Russophobia have done so under strict, uh, uh, motivated strictly by partisan political reasons. Uh, their party is under fire uh, for being, you know, on the, on the uh, Trump is a Russian puppet accusation, so they are, I think, understandably trying to uh, uh, combat that, uh, that, that accusation. Uh, the, the fear that I have is that we're not getting this from, uh, you know, the editorials, uh, offices of the New York Times and the Washington Post exclusively. This Russophobia is being spread by uh, social media extensively. It's also being done, I mean, everyone knows the uh, uh, Tokyo Rose, if you will, uh, of the Russian conspiracy theory is, uh, the par excellence is Rachel Maddow at MSNBC, uh, who almost nightly for years has uh, developed every sort of grotesque and, and uh, maniacal uh, Russian uh, conspiracy theory. I recall seeing her on YouTube several months ago where she was reporting, as though she's a weatherman or a climatologist, that there was record cold temperatures in Fargo, North Dakota, and then says, imagine if the Russians cut off heat. This is one of those sardonic laughs I, I, I told you uh, uh, are, these comments would evoke. Uh, we also, though, all have to say that uh, late night comedians who have become really the political spokespeople now uh, for most Americans. I wonder how many people really listen to the cable televisions as opposed to how many people pour their third glass of wine, light up a reefer, and listen to the likes of uh, Bill Maher and uh, Stephen Colbert. Colbert is unrelenting, and anyone who watches him knows this. It's almost nightly where he goes into Russian diatribes, anti-Russian diatribes. They are, uh, sickeningly in my opinion, racist, xenophobic, homophobic. He, is, he and his crew, and uh, a good deal of the uh, Russophones, uh, it's no surprise to any of you, if you've uh, watched anything on, on television or the internet the last three years, there are actually great big billboards around the country with Vladimir Putin, where Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump are portrayed kissing passionately. Uh, there are any number of them uh, even more graphic in homosexual relations. Uh, apparently homophobia is perfectly all right if it's aimed at the right people. Uh, it, this is really a fault. Uh, similarly, the xenophobia. Uh, while criticizing Trump rightly uh, for three, you know, three of the five deplorable categories, if you recollect, are xenophobia, racism, and homophobia, and the Russophobes are exploiting three of those to beat the band. Uh, I'm going to read you a couple of statements that you may be familiar with, and I'm going to use language that I ordinarily wouldn't use, but I think we need to hear the original language. Uh, former uh, National Intelligence Director James Clapper, as you probably know, several months ago, made a statement that, um, I want to get this precisely, where he said, you'll pardon me, there's uh, rather an embarrassment of riches with this information, I'm trying to reduce them to order. Um, Clapper said, uh, that the, the Russians are almost genetically driven. Russians, uh, qua Russians, right? We're not talking about the Russian government. We're not talking about the Vladimir Putin administration. We're not talking about Russian intelligence services. The Russians are almost genetically driven. And I'll try to find the exact quote. I'll have it in a moment. In the meantime, though, I want to, uh, the phone conversations and text messaging between Lisa Page and Peter Strzok at the FBI. Keeping in mind that Strzok was in charge of uh, FBI counterintelligence operations and basically launched the Russia collusion conspiracy investigation, right? These are excerpts, if you haven't heard them, uh, in communication between him and his lover, Lisa Page. Page says, I do always hate the Russians. It is my opinion that with respect to Western ideals, and who it is and what it is we stand for as Americans, Russia poses the most dangerous threat to them. Russia, not Putin, not the Kremlin, Russia poses the most dangerous threat to that way of life. The conversation goes on. Struck, texted page, fuck the cheating motherfucking Russians, bastards, I hate them, 
I think they're probably the worst fucking, conniving, cheating savages. Now, I invite any savages. I invite anyone in this, uh, you know, in this group today to suggest if that comment had been made publicly or privately and then revealed publicly about any other ethnic group in this, on this planet, whether there would not have been a far more uh, passionate, you know, nobody seems to be concerned about that except myself. Uh, their language goes on. Um, this, uh, there was, uh, I don't want to get into too many of the details, so I'm ready to you know, uh, uh, talk about them in the question and answer period, uh, about the actual details of the accusation of Russian collusion conspiracy. But amongst this torturous, uh, labyrinthine uh, series of things about uh, Putin's niece, Russian consulate in Miami, uh, what are some of the others? Um, uh, uh, Trump's uh, attorney, uh, Michael Cohen going to Prague. Putin doesn't have a niece. There is no Russian consulate in Miami. And Michael Cohen said, at least uh, under uh, uh, sworn testimony in Congress, that he's never been to Prague. So, uh, but to the you know, Russian conspiracy uh, theorist, uh, don't let the facts get in the way. Um, there is one theory, of course, that the Russian intelligence services somehow tapped into the DNC uh, server and released information through some mysterious entity in Romania called Guccifer. 2.0. According to Hillary Clinton, there's also a Macedonian connection. So uh, I don't know if they can find any more obscure countries in the world to you know, pull into this international nexus. Maybe Paulu, um, uh, Liechtenstein. But anyways, the discussion goes on between Page and Strzok. Page has, um, I want to find the Guccifer, sleazy Romanian, Strzok wrote. Page responds, they all are. Uh, Strzok says, funny to watch and think of, it's redacted. No wonder, uh, so forth, those Romanians aren't even the gypsies. That is, they're so bad, they're presumably even worse than the gypsies. Or the gypsies are so bad, the Romanians are no better. Uh, you know, no racism here, of course. Right? And then they go on. Seriously, I kind of hate them, uh, but they have, the Romanians. But they have the crookedness of the Russians with the entitledness of the Italians, Page answers. Page goes on, and this is, uh, I'll wrap it up here. These are people working for the FBI, one of whom is in charge of initiating the Russian collusion investigation. Uh, they don't recuse themselves. There's no conflict of interest here. They have no bias. Uh, Page goes on about the Russians. Um, Russians, all of them, she, she says, I hate them. I think they're probably the worst. Very little I find redeeming about this. Even in history, a couple of good writers and artists, I guess, probably the worst. Uh, you know, I invite, I defy anyone to uh, think of a statement made by an entire ethnic group or nationality like that that would pass muster. And by the way, these people consider themselves liberals and enlightened. Remember, this is St. Peter Strzok, who I could smell the Trump voters in a Walmart. These are liberal elite uh, people who could use language like that. The uh, Clapper statement, uh, which you should hear in its entirety, is the Russians almost genetically driven to co-opt, penetrate, gain favor, whatever, which is a typical Russian technique. This is you know, pretty much what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with uh, pretty close to half the adult population of the United States, which rationally, irrationally, consciously, unconsciously, or some combination of all of them, has been won over to the campaign that the Russians are evil, racially inferior, genetically driven, uncultured, filthy animals, even worse than Romanians, gypsies, and Italians. And this, this, is, and this is proper uh, discourse now amongst not backwoods Republicans, but amongst the most educated and uh, by their own definition at least, uh, the most enlightened uh, people in the country. That is a very dangerous president. This is far more dangerous than the Cold War in that respect. Keeping in mind also, for ideological reasons, during the Cold War, there always had to be a distinction drawn between you know, the Communist Party and the Soviet people, the Russian people. Uh, the Russians are good, their government was bad. Now, as you can see, they're all lumped in the same, same category. We don't make any distinction. They're just evil and uh, you know, driven to co-op and penetrate and, and uh, do nasty, rotten things because they're not really fully human, I guess, is, is the assumption. Uh, this goes on day after day. Uh, I mean, to the degree of sickening. I would suggest an experiment. Uh, go to YouTube when you have the opportunity. 
go to any of the um, network or cable uh, TV program, uh, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, uh, CNN, anything other than Fox, for you know, partisan political reasons, and view the uh, look at the, uh, the listeners' comments. View the listeners' comments beneath. You will see hundreds, one after another. If you type in the word Russia, of course. Uh, you'll see hundreds, one after another, uh, attacking Russia, attacking the Russians, attacking anyone who doesn't attack. Them. I mean, this is something out of uh, Arthur Miller's The Crucible, right? Uh, today's witch hunters, tomorrow are going to be the witches. And we've seen it where, you know, as ludicrous as I, you know, as it seems, as I mentioned, that Lindsey Graham, you know, can actually be referred to as Leningrad Lindsey. Uh, and I don't know how humorous that's meant to be, but if it's humorous today, it won't be tomorrow. If anyone gets in somebody's way, they're going to be accused of being a Russian image. So. Um, that's uh, the internal situation. Um, one can argue, uh, then, uh, is the Russia collusion theory, which I think we, uh, all sensible people would have to say, not only the release of the uh, Mueller report in March, but the, uh, you know, his appearance before the, uh, the House Committee a couple weeks ago, I, I think s thoroughly puts the rest any, uh, any reasonable uh, claim that the any Russian entity, uh, government or otherwise, successfully intervened in the U.S. election. Now, as for the hacking of the DNC emails, uh, it still uh, needs to be proven that any of this, even assuming all of it is true, influenced a single vote, one way or the other, right? Or influenced uh, any state with its electoral votes being shifted from what would have been the Clinton to the uh, uh, Trump uh, column uh, because of the interference of uh, you know, external factors. Uh, somebody by the name of Dr. Robert Epstein, an American psychologist uh, in England, uh, I saw on YouTube the other day suggesting that YouTube uh, search result manipulations, by his estimate, could have swung between 2.4 and 10.6 million votes to Hillary Clinton. I can't you know, establish whether that's true or not, but let's put that on one side of the scales and weigh uh, what you know, $46,000 worth of Facebook ads, many of them after the election, were likely to have had in determining the election in uh, you know, November of 2016. Now, as to the press campaign about the Russian collusion conspiracy, and I'm using both words because uh, in the Mueller report, I haven't read it, but I'm familiar with aspects of it, uh, the words at times are used interchangeably. When Mueller is asked if collusion means conspiracy, he says no, but in the report that if you watched his uh, testimony, by the way, he seemed to be woefully unfamiliar with the report that bears his name. But uh, there were at least intimations in the report that this, uh, the collusion, if it existed, was tantamount to conspiracy. Conspiracy means treason. Treason is a capital offense in the United States. Anyone convicted on, on that charge could be executed. So we're, we're talking uh, you know, pretty, some pretty dangerous stuff. Uh, after the Mueller report, redacted, as you know, was released in March, uh, the heroic, in my opinion, Glenn Greenwald was on Democracy Now! And um, he referred to, to the entire uh, situation as follows. And I, it's one of the better statements I've heard, by the way. Uh, I'm quoting him word for word. He says, this whole Russian conspiracy uh, um, debacle or charade is the saddest media spectacle I've ever seen since I first began practicing journalism in 2005. He then quotes the Rolling Stones' Matt Taibbi saying, uh, what this was, oh, no, I'm sorry, I want to finish it, Greenwald, who also threw in, uh, this whole thing was a scam and a fraud. He then quotes Taibbi saying, this is worse than the Iraq war media distraction. And uh, this has been, you know, the Judith Miller, uh, uh, you know, controversy in the New York Times and so forth, where we were uh, stampeded, you know, into, into panicking and, and war with, with Iraq. Uh, a similar statement has been made by, uh, you know, other people, other comment, uh, Jonathan Turley is one of them, if I can get to it real quickly. Uh, who says basically the same thing, this is comparable to the lead up to the war against Iraq, you know, late 2002, early, early 2003. Uh, does that mean quite literally that this is a lead up to war? I sincerely hope not. But I think there's a, there is enough resemblance. I mean, you don't poison the well. You don't poison the atmosphere as thoroughly as we have. You don't create a mere panic level of hysteria and, and so forth 
unless you plan to tap that and use it for some reason other than getting Donald Trump out of the White House. About which, and I don't think this is, this is rarely addressed at all, if all adequately in my estimate. The reason that uh, you know half the political establishment, more than half the political establishment, because it also means the or the so-called country club Republicans, or the uh, never Trumper Republicans, uh, we have to recollect it was none other than John McCain who de uh, delivered the infamous Steele dossier, salacious and unverified, uh, in the words of the FBI head. Uh, it was John McCain who developed, uh, who delivered that to uh, to Comey at the uh, FBI. Right? So this was a, a dossier commissioned by the Hillary campaign and the Democratic National Committee brought in MI, an MI6 agent. The document is then delivered by the person who ran against Obama not too many years ago uh, to the FBI to be used to uh, deep sex the campaign of the Republican nominee, Donald Trump. So um, we, uh, I think, have to realize why the Russia conspiracy theory has been so central over the last three years. And my interpretation is this, that to uh, effectively impeach Donald Trump, I'm not a lawyer, but I think this is something we all probably recall from the, uh, the Clinton and the Nixon cases. Uh, somebody has to be guilty of, a, a, of a, a crime or an infraction while serving in office. Um, you know, I certainly would not be surprised to know Mr. Trump is uh, most guilty of prosecutable offenses uh, for activities prior to his coming into the White House. But the only way of getting him out of the White House, barring direct uh, uh, reason to impeach him for something he's done, is to simply invalidate the election. And the Russian conspiracy theory has the appeal, it does, I suspect, to uh, you know, traditional Republicans and the entire Democratic Party uh, establishment, exactly because it nullifies the election. If the Russians swung the election and cheated Hillary Clinton, then Hillary Clinton really won the election. Trump not only should be removed from office, he should have his name removed from the history books. He was never legitimately president of the United States. And I think that's why it's had this hold. Uh, even before he was inaugurated, Frank Rich, late of the New York Times, now with, uh, what is it, some New York Nation. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I had an article in roughly December of 2016, and by the way, I mean, we've been around the block a few times politically. There are things in, a, in a, you know, newspapers of record like that, you don't say unless you're pretty safe, you're pretty sure you're covered. And he made a statement in December of 2016 to the effect that Donald Trump is going to die in prison for treason. Um, you know, I don't want to be melodramatic about this, and I don't want to bring up you know, genre fiction or espionage books or something, but it's almost like you don't say that about a sitting president unless you know for a fact he's going down. <laughs> um, and I think you know, somewhere along the line there was probably a supposition, and it would be a correct one in my estimate, that there was enough support within the Republican Party hierarchy, especially in the, the House of Lords, right, in the Senate, that um, if the Democrats could regain control of the House in 2018, there would be enough Republicans ready to vote for conviction in the Senate. I think that had to be the game. But at any rate, um, against that now, what do we see also? We see uh, Rachel Maddow, and anyone who didn't see this, please look it up on YouTube. Uh, while a few months ago it appeared as though John Bolton was going to uh, uh, have his fantasy realized and there was going to be military action against Venezuela, uh, Rachel Maddow on MSNBC gets up and says, with a picture of Bolton in the background, no matter what we've thought of him in the past, we really have to applaud his, fir you know, his, his firm uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela. This is remarkable. Now, I can translate that for you. Venezuela is a Russian ally. Russia is bad. We destroy Russia's allies. John Bolton is our friend and ally. I mean, that's how I translate it, and I don't think it's any more sophisticated than that, right? So that means a lot of nasty people now become our allies. Let's recall uh, the uh, days leading up to the infamous John McCain's uh, funeral, where uh, established liberal publications were condemning Trump's insensitivity to this great American war hero. When George H.W. Bush died, Liberal and even seemingly progressive people know. Uh, uh, look how rude he is to this great American uh, uh, war hero during World War II, and head of the CIA, and boy, isn't that patriotic, and, and uh, president, and the, uh, you know, the uh, monster who created Operation Desert Storm. So it's, it's gone so bad that what we're seeing is the resurrection of Cold War uh, zealots 
into being in many ways uh, you know, heroes to people who consider themselves liberal or even leftists. There are two books published. Like, by the way, there's a, a veritable industry of Russian collusion books. Uh, go to Amazon, just look, you know, Russian collusion. There'll be dozens. I mean, this is a gold mine for certain people. But uh, two books were published on both ends of this d debate recently. Uh, and I want to focus just on the title. titles. One is Stephen Cohen, uh, you know, Russian Studies Professor at Princeton, on the editorial board of the nation. And his book is called, uh, let, the, let the title sink in, War with Russia, question mark, from Putin and Ukraine to Trump and Russia Gate. Another book was published by Michael Isakoff. You'll recall his name. He's the chief investigative journalist with Yahoo News. He's been around the block also with major, uh, you know, publication, major news establishment news publications. He wrote an article uh, in Yahoo News in connection with the release of the Steele dossier. The FBI then used his article to corroborate the Steele dossier. I mean, this is a real shell game. He co-wrote with David Korn of Mother Jones a book, the title is Russian Roulette, the inside story of Putin's war on America and the election of Donald Trump. I should mention, just show, you know, when Hannah Arendt, uh, talking about the Nuremberg trials, uh, referred to the banality of evil, this is an example. To use a, a tired, cliched, threadbare expression like Russian Roulette, and then I, I'm sorry I can't show it to you, as you might expect, on the cover, the first R in Russian is reversed, so that it looks like, I mean, in the, in, yeah, in the word Russian, um, to uh, represent the Russian character that was pronounced Ya. I mean, this is getting to the level of a comic book, but it's, you know, the, but there's something very dangerous behind it all. Um, yesterday, I was uh, looking through YouTube, and um, there's a ma major Russian mainstream uh, television news program called Vestia News, or Vestia. And uh, the, the article was, or the topic was, NATO leak 150 nuclear bombs on Russian, Russia's borders. We can dispute whether that's true or not. I wasn't able to establish where they found the leak. But the, one of the moderators of the show, after, after a discussion of several issues around this line, uh, asked the following question to all the, all the people on the panel. Should we launch a preemptive strike? I, uh, about two and a half weeks ago, Dmitry Sines, who's you know, a major think tank analyst, uh, Russian born, um, had an, uh, an article I saw in Yahoo News, by the way. And the, uh, the title was, Are Russia and America Headed Towards Nuclear War? And it was an interview with a Russian military expert. Uh, I don't think this is hyperbole. I don't believe people are using language. Stephen Cohen is most assuredly not using language like this because he wants to incite a conflict between the United States and Russia. Uh, several months ago, the infamous Max Boot, Council of Foreign Relations, also Russian-born, Soviet-born, was on a, a TV program, uh, Anderson Cooper's, I remember, with uh, Stephen Cohen. And Cohen is, you know, a distinguished scholar. Um, and he mentions uh, in, in passing that he's been a Russian scholar for 40 years, and Booth says, and a Russian agent for 40 years. This is the depth. I mean, I, I swear to you, I mean, I paid a lot of attention during the, the McCarthy period. I mean, I was born in the McCarthy period, but during the Cold War, I don't remember anything of this order. The other thing I want to say, and I, I'm going to get a bit personal about this, you see my last name. Uh, I lived through the Cold War. My paternal grandfather was born in Russia. According to his wife, my grandmother, uh, a kind of fraternal Russian-American organization he was a member of was raided by the FBI while she was present. They padlocked it and so forth. Uh, she, I just learned recently that she, though born in the United States, uh, had married my grandfather who was born in Russia. And um, my grandfather became an American citizen, but because of the infamous Mitchell Palmer raids in 1919 and this you know, reign of terror that came down on immigrants because of the Russian Revolution, that she lost her American citizenship. And she, born in the United States, had to reapply for American citizenship because she had married uh, a legal immigrant. So this is you know, the sort of backdrop you have to look at how deeply uh, you know, anyone of Russian descent feels this. Uh, this is from uh, Jonathan Turley, who's a pretty mainstream um, journalist. 
if I can find the exact thing. Because uh, there was something discussed in the Senate, introduced by the Democrats, needless to say. Um, I'll come up with the exact name, but it was an initiative by uh, uh, senators of the Democratic Party to uh, investigate anyone involved in the 2016 election or politics in general in the United States who is a Russian national, has moved here from Russia, or who is of Russian descent. It says specifically parents or grandparents who came from Russia. Uh, I, this, should, this would, by the way, as somebody pointed out, would include um, Bernie Sanders. Amongst the people accused of being Russian agents or acting as Russian agents, Jill Stein. Jill Stein. Uh, I mentioned uh, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell and so forth. Uh, other people, have been, uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, I can remember when uh, Rand Paul, a libertarian, Tea Party libertarian, uh, senator, uh, got up uh, a couple of years ago in, in the Senate and said about NATO, which had just inducted its 29th member of Montenegro, 600,000 pe 600, people, uh, which seems to exist for no other reason than cigarette smuggling, and allowing Russian oligarchs to buy up seafront property. I mean, seriously. Uh, when Rand Paul rhetorically says, is it worth go, uh, initiating World War III to defend Montenegro under NATO's Article 5 Mutual Defense Clause, uh, John McCain gets up and says, you are a Russian agent. So this, this is what we're doing. Now, in 2002, the George W. Bush administration withdrew the United States from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. ABM tree. Uh, you may know on August the 3rd, uh, the U.S., the Trump administration uh, withdrew the United States from the International Intermediate, Intermediate thank you, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, which had been initiated by uh, uh, Reagan and, and Gorbachev in the, in the uh, 80s. With the buildup now of new technology, including uh, nuclear cruise missiles, uh, other missiles that kind of uh, blur the distinction. There are four uh, gradations, by the way, of uh, ranges of miss missiles. They're, uh, they're short range, uh, medium range, intermediate range, there's a difference, and long range. The um, IBM Treaty, International uh, Ballistic Missile Treaty, is also coming up very shortly. You know, and, and that uh, speculation is will also go the way of the other two treaties. Uh, in February of 2021, the New Star Treaty, Strategic uh, uh, Arms Reduction Treaty, uh, comes up and looks like that will be scrapped. Additionally, there's even talk about the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty being disband or being uh, ended. Uh, about which this Russian program I mentioned to university, they mentioned the fact that aside from the leak that there are 150 U.S. nuclear weapons on Russia's borders, what is incontestable is that there are five countries in Europe that have U.S. B-61 nuclear gravity bombs. They are Turkey, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Uh, Turkeys are housed at the Encherlik Air Base, which is dangerously close to Russia. Uh, as was mentioned on this Russian show, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, uh, amongst uh, uh, the uh, factors determining uh, the use of nuclear weapons is there to be staged, uh, st uh, there to be based only in the host country, right? There's no provision by which one country can move nuclear weapons around the world. The U.S. has routinely done that. Um, the second thing is that part of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty was, that was the initial step that was supposed to lead to the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons as a whole. There's no discussion of that anymore. So we're living in a situation where three things are occurring uh, simultaneously. We're seeing a globally a worsening of uh, the crisis between the U.S. and Russia. Keep in mind, these are the two countries who, with the New START Treaty, still have 1,500 uh, nuclear weapons actively based, ready to go, deployed, ready to go. It's 15,000, isn't it? I think it's down 1,500. Only 1,500? Yeah, but I mean, they have uh, uh, arsenals of you know, the, yeah. considerably more, uh, which could be activated. So that's a good point. They're the only two countries with a triad of delivery systems. No long-range bombers, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, ground-based uh, uh, ballistic missiles. 
So uh, an exacerbation between ten uh, intentions be of tensions between those two countries, of course, takes on peculiar significance. As dangerous as the current Kashmir crisis is, and it is, this would be the most immediate threat to the nuclear conflict I think we've seen right, ever. You know, uh, accepting uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima as not being so much a conflict with the use of nuclear weapons, but. Um, in this situation to exacerbate uh, uh, proxy and other conflicts, by the way, I didn't even mention Syria. Okay? Um, the Russophobia by extension, again, all of the Cold War, it's not just that Russia is inherently evil, but anyone who has good state-to-state -state relations with Russia is also an enemy that needs to be destroyed. Uh, you might remember when the Trump administration launched 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles into Syria, that uh, newscaster, anchorman newscaster Brian Downey showed photographs, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean of them being launched from destroyers, and said, beautiful, beautiful twice. And because he had just died, I think, uh, shortly before, he quotes a line from a song by uh, Leonard Cohen. What a beautiful sight, Tom Hawk Cruz was uh, being fired into a defenseless country, no? So, uh, we now see that a lot of the justification for uh, hostilities against Venezuela and Iran, Syria, and anyone else, uh, uh, either are manifestations of uh, you know, the, the Russophobia, or can be uh, justified as saying, yeah, this is a way of getting back at Russia you know, uh, through their proxies. This is, again, you know, very similar to what happened in the Cold War, but uh, there was a comment by a NATO official recently. I don't know, I'm going to backtrack a couple steps. Uh, a couple, three years ago, maybe more, somebody put out a map that was very interesting. And they showed uh, basically Eurasia, and they showed current Russia, post-Soviet Russia. And then they showed uh, all the NATO countries bordering it. During the Cold War, there was only a narrow strip of uh, Norway that connected NATO uh, to Russia. In 2004, seven Eastern European countries were inducted into NATO at the same time. Uh, three of them former Soviet republics, and all but one of them former Warsaw Pact members. Four countries at one time joined NATO that border Russia. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. Uh, for, since that period, exactly 2004, 2005, there's something called NATO air policing uh, going in, out in the Balkans, in the Baltics. And there are up to 12 uh, you know, sophisticated warplanes from NATO countries. Just the other day, one of them, a Spanish F-16, buzzed uh, the airplane of the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. Uh, this is pretty dangerous stuff, right? And this isn't happening you know, off the, uh, the New York Harbor. This is happening in the St. Lawrence Seaway. This is happening uh, you know, miles off the Russian border in the Baltic Sea. So that, what your, this map I was alluding to showed uh, all the, the military bases. Right? There are eight major military bases in Bulgaria and Romania that the US and NATO have taken over. There are major military bases in Poland. There are military installations in Azerbaijan and Georgia on Russian southern border. They've expanded NATO presence in Turkey to include a um, X-band uh, uh, radar that takes, uh, for missile defense radar, it takes in almost all of the Russians so forth. And the map shows all this buildup and it says, look at the nasty Russians, how they move their country so <laughs> close to NATO bases. But I actually saw a statement, I mean, this wasn't even ironic. Uh, on the NATO website that says we're increasingly concerned about Russia moving hardware near to NATO countries. And they talked about the Kaliningrad uh, exclave, right? You know, part of Russia. Uh, that how dare the Russians move uh, missiles uh, in Kaliningrad borders Lithuania and Poland, right? The question is not why Lithuania and Poland are moving in NATO. It's why Russia would dare to bring certain types of you know, uh, missiles into their territory, now bordering uh, NATO territory. So, um, We've got all that going on simultaneously. Uh, we have uh, any number of flashpoints, and it doesn't take you know, an F-16 to, uh, to buzz uh, the defense minister's plane to touch off something ugly. Uh, anything could erupt in Ukraine tomorrow again. This has been a simmering war that's gone on for four and a half years. Uh, it could be something again in the Caucasus. It could be, you know, any number of things could occur that could trigger a uh, conflict. And uh, the Trump administration, let's not fool ourselves, right? Or, or rather, let's not be fooled by, uh, you know, the Russophobes who have uh, played this off as though he is somehow a puppet of Russia, which is an astonishing thing. Um, the real beginning of this thing, in my, my opinion, is during one of the debates you know, 2016 between Clinton and Trump. And as I recollect, Trump says in so many words, um, 
Vladimir Putin to Clinton doesn't respect you, he won't fear you. Now, I read that, I mean, tell me what you think about it, as uh, you're not strong enough vis-a-vis -vis Russia, or you're indecisive, or feckless, or whatever it happens to be, I'll be strong. And that's hardly a pro-Russian statement. It's at that point where she says, and if you get elected, they'll have a puppet. Huh? Uh, he, since he's come in, not only did he, uh, you know, launch 59 cruise missiles into Syria and probably kill some, uh, some Russian nationals into the bargain, I'm sure. Not only has he shaken down NATO for an additional billion dollars worth of pledges from uh, European NATO allies to meet their 2% uh, requirement under NATO conditions, but when his now Secretary of State, Mike, Mike Pompeo, then acting CIA director, when he, during the confirmation hearings for his becoming Secretary of State, gets up, I saw it on YouTube, and says, uh, we killed several hundred Russians in Syria. That's a quote. We killed hundreds of Russians in Syria. The report was up to 300 Russian contractor, uh, contractor employees killed. Uh, if that's pro-Russian, I, I really hesitate uh, to see you know, what, what an anti-Russian would look like. So I think we have to disabuse ourselves of the idea that uh, he's been blackmailed because he paid prostitutes to urinate on the bed, um, or that he wanted to set up a casino in you know, Kharkov. I, you know, I don't know what these uh, theories are meant to, to uh, establish, but I think we can clearly look at the record, and there's no reason to believe. I mean, he's been much more bellicose towards both Iran and, and Venezuela, Russian allies. Uh, he's increased U.S. military presence on the ground in Syria. You know, there was a very negligible number under the Obama administration, and they weren't even always open to knowledge to be there. So uh, the, the claim that uh, you know, he's, he's soft on Russia, if, if not a Russian agent or puppet or what have you, is simply belied by the facts. I mean, the, the facts don't establish that quite the opposite, in my opinion. I want to bring up, though, something that's, uh, because up until now I've been pretty much speaking about the, the established elites and their, their mouthpieces in the United States, you know, the leadership of the Republican Democratic parties uh, and their uh, you know, Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post, and we have Times uh, and Cable and Network Television. But in um, early this year, uh, the U.S. House passed a re resolution, House Resolution 676, called the NATO Support Act. And this I find particularly troublesome, and I'd be remiss if I didn't raise this issue because it, it tends to suggest to me how far this thing has spread. Uh, the bill is, I think, unprecedented. I know nothing like it. It states, and I'll read you some of the excerpts, NATO is described, this is a, you know, the military bloc that now has 77 members and, and uh, partners, over a third of the countries in the world, that has waged war in three different continents, in Europe, Africa, and Asia, that uh, uh, recently has inducted, and most recently since the Chicago uh, summit of NATO in 2012, has brought in nine new countries under a program called Partners Across the Globe. The, these are Mongolia that borders both Russia and China. Uh, Kazakhstan that borders both Russia and China is a long-term NATO partner, actually an advanced partnership program. The other partners across the globe include South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and most recently Colombia. So NATO now has a partner in South America. In fact, has a partner in every uh, continent except Antarctica. This uh, organization is referred to in House Resolution 676 as a pillar of international peace and stability. It is described as one of the most successful military alliances in history. It um, promotes a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. And anyone who hasn't heard that phrase, Europe, whole, free, and at peace, it uh, was originally introduced by George H.W. Bush in 1989 in Mainz, Germany, in a speech of that title. Uh, you know, the ruling elite and the uh, military-industrial complex uh, signal each other oftentimes, like street gangs do, and they're morally and otherwise not uh, you know, too far removed. Uh, by using certain catchphrases, that's one of them. Uh, do a web search sometime on that expression. You're a pole and free, hopefully you're a pole free and at peace. But it originates in 1989 from Bush. It uh, predated uh, the reunification of Germany, which is what he's foreseen, the expansion of NATO towards the Russian border simply by the incorporation of the former German Democratic Republic, 
and uh, led up to, of course, eventually its, it's uh, you know, NATO expansion and all that. But this House resolution uses that buzz phrase, uh, pay attention next to me, right? Uh, it then says, uh, this resolution, that our um, uh, uh, irresponsible European NATO allies must pay their 2% of the gross domestic product into the military, the demands that they do. They're shaking them down, like Trump should. Uh, it also says, uh, particularly, and this is where it gets to the crux of the issue, uh, it, it is in this sense that the Congress demands that, quote, the President shall not withdraw the United States from NATO. Who in God's name believes that the President wants to withdraw the U.S. from NATO? Right, the one who went to the summit last year in Warsaw? The one who shook down his allies for another billion dollars? But the Democrats are, are concerned that Trump is going to withdraw the United States from NATO. Um, he, they also talk about uh, something called the European Def uh, Deterrence Initiative. And here's the exact quote from the resolution. Um, it is meant to deter and defend against Russian aggression. It then appends a statement from the last NATO summit uh, that states uh, Russia must withdraw its troops from Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia. By Moldova, they mean Transnistria. And by Georgia, they mean Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and Crimea is Crimea. Uh, this is more complex than really justifies my getting into it, but we have to recollect that certain political entities, I mentioned earlier autonomous republics in the former Soviet Union. An autonomous republic was a republic within a federal republic. And this makes perfect sense within the Soviet context, but made no sense prior to the Soviet context, and makes absolutely no sense post the Soviet Union. So, that when the Soviet Union began to break up, even before it was formally dissolved, certain of these entities fought not to be incorporated into an independent Georgia or Moldova and so forth. So, but this is what this resolution says. It is uh, insightful, I mean, C-I-T-E, uh, insightful. It is uh, uh, one of the more uh, you know, offensive statements of I mean, you know, the Russian general staff, I suspect, you know, saying something like that. The vote was passed with only 22 no votes. The 22 were all Republican. Amongst the people who voted for it, to her great credit, Tulsi Gabbard either abstained or wasn't present. Amongst the people who voted for it, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Johan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, Chicago's own Jesus Garcia. I'm mentioning these people because uh, I think people would have expected better from them. I don't know how in heaven's name they can justify voting for this. This was one of the first House votes that came up after they entered the Congress. Uh, I, am dis I, knew, I mean, I know Jesus Garcia, or I knew him, and I can't tell you all hurt I am, uh, that he would sign on to something like that for whatever reason. Uh, I know the excuse will be this was to stick it to Trump, but surely there are other ways of doing it. I'm going to wrap it up on, on this basis. Uh, Aaron Mate, who if you don't watch him, he, he writes, but he also has a YouTube station called Gray Zone. Um, he's recently spoken, he said, um, with all the reasons people could have gone out in the street and protested uh, decisions made by the current administration, why is it the only time they really came out, anyone really came out for, in force over the last couple of years? was when Jeff Sessions uh, resigned a few months ago. And uh, mass demonstrations occurred in 30 or 40 cities the very next day with expensive professional signs, uh, with in some cases people out there with lyrics to popular songs re reworked uh, on the Mueller investigation. I remember one that ended in the refrain, Putin's whore. Uh, I, mentioned this to uh, Robert earlier, and I want to find the exact uh, comments, because uh, this suggests that, you know, we're up against something a lot bigger than just the establishment parties. Um, when um, Jeff Sessions resigned or was asked or was forced to resign, um, Anna Gallant, who was the exec is or was the executive director of Move On, uh, set up an initiative called Trump is Not Above the Law and supposedly to protect the Mueller investigation because we all knew he was going to approve, uh, come up with proof definitive that Trump and everyone he's ever met were working for the KGB uh, based in Leningrad 
um, and so forth. Uh, and what what she what the, the website said was Trump is not the, uh, not above the law. Rapid response events, and uh, she said that 400,000 contacts have been uh, notified in 900 cities to come out. That is a mass mobilization, in my opinion, unprecedented since the, those against the uh, war in Iraq. I can't think, there may be the Women's March would be the only other one I could think of, of those dimensions. I looked at some of the videotapes of the, the marches in various cities. Some of the signs said, Joe McCarthy, where are you now that we need you? One of them said, treason, espionage, traitor. One said, burn in the USSR. One said, people power, not Putin power. I remember seeing a sign of uh, uh, somebody looking like a rock guitarist, and he had the you know, orange-yellow pompadour that, that you know, is, is, is Trump. And playing off the Bruce Springsteen song, it said, born in the USSR. So uh, I, I want to tell you just how nasty this has become and how deeply ingrained in, in, in people's thinking and, and the emotions, even more than thinking. Uh, the Russophobia has become, and that this, this thing is not simply limited to, and I would argue, is really uh, not primarily the result of this is a nice way of getting Trump. I think that is part of this. I think there's a lot of political opportunism, and when I mentioned the five uh, freshman Congress people I did earlier, uh, I would have to guess that their inspiration was anything you can use to get Trump, and that means building up a military alliance that is. Uh, wage wars of aggression against uh, you know, defenseless countries uh, in three different continents, so that's fine, right? Uh, there's a Latin expression that says, uh, fiat justicia, justicia periat mundus, uh, let justice be done though the world ends, perishes. Uh, I fear that there are people, not only within the Democratic Party, there are people who would consider themselves to be progressives and leftists and so forth, who uh, in order to bring down Trump, would, like Samson, bring down the pillars on the entire temple. And uh, I would caution us to be, very, uh, to be very concerned about that and to urge people to step back from this. Because the end result is, with the cancellation of major missile treaties, with the uh, uh, increased tension between Russia and the United States, this thing could rapidly get out of hand. And we could go from uh, Russophobia aimed at Trump to uh, being exploited by some other force, including the current administration, you know, to eventually use that animosity towards Russia to build, to build up the drums for some kind of dangerous confrontation, the results of which potentially are, are something we don't even want to consider. Thanks very much for your time. That was a rather chilling presentation, I, I have to say, uh, as much as I think I've ever heard uh, at OUL. Uh, you know, uh, before I, I'm gonna make a comment question, but uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, the shortcut link, open unit of the left dash YouTube, this will be on our YouTube channel, hopefully uh, late this evening, early tomorrow morning. So, uh, you know, if you got any friends or yourself, you want to replay this, you want to hear this, uh, it'll, it'll be there probably within the next 10 or 12 hours. Uh, with regards to the talk, you know, uh, one of the things that has really troubled me is that, like, it's almost, it doesn't matter where I go. I mean, well, uh, RT accepted, okay? And I can't even watch that on television anymore in Chicago because it's, uh, they, they removed it, of course. You know, you get it online. But um, uh, it's like, I mean, I, I'm in complete accord with your, you know, the, this, this grim kind of uh, analysis. Uh, because, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, over and over and over again, you know, we see this demonization that's been going on vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, and uh, where is there anything whatsoever coming out? And I, and I, to answer my own question, I don't see it. But anybody, you know, trying to sound remotely even reasonable. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about like the individuals that you listed at the beginning. You know, there are obviously... Um, voices in the wilderness, so to speak, that are, are, are trying to signal uh, to our population about how dangerous this is 
and how you know really off the wall things have gotten. But um, w w I guess well, my question being to you, do you do you think that I mean, w have you tried to analyze from the standpoint of like getting into the heads of these? like the Rachel Maddows, I mean, what do they see? I mean, I, I'm at a loss to understand this myself, you know, because it's kind of the old thing. Remember what they used to talk about, um, uh, Herman Kahn, remember on thermonuclear war? I don't know if you remember the title. We had this notion about MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. Whatever happened to any and all of this, you know? These used to be part of that discussion and it's like we're not there anymore. We've gone. We we have gone mad for all practical purposes. I'll leave it at that. You can address that point. <laughs> I, I, That's I, that play on words is going to be very difficult to follow up on. Uh, no, your point is well taken. Uh, in the course of discussing, you know, the issues that, and they're important issues, economic and social and climate and so forth, uh, we tend to lose uh, folk, historical folk or historical uh, perspective or focus on these things. And this ca current Kashmir Kashmir crisis, uh, trust me, this is, is dangerous beyond comprehension. A couple of days ago, I think ten soldiers on both sides of the line of control were killed, you no know, Pakistani and Indian. And uh, it was understood, I think, with all the treaties we're talking about, starting with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the I ICBM Treaty, was that the U.S. and, and the so then Soviet Union and Russia now is the successor state to the Soviet Union had a particular responsibility, because they were the ones who brought this monster into the world that not only must they disarm, but they must lead an international effort to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to bring about the destruction of those that exist, as earlier mentioned. The fact that this, is, this subject has been off the table for the last couple of decades, I think that, look, I cannot, sub, I cannot uh, characterize it otherwise than as this, this way. Uh, when uh, the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, um, I think we all just said, okay, now we can all go home, no threat, peace has come on the world, we're in the age of Aquarius, and uh, so forth, right? The, the exact opposite happened. You know, people, uh, the U.S. and company, uh, this is a unipolar in the world that Putin had the uh, audacity to remark, um, is that uh, it led to an increased recklessness and adventurism around the world because there's no counterbalance. I think that was predictable, right? But unfortunately, we can't even agree on something as simple as you know, uh, abolishing weapons uh, in countries that are in a state of hot war right now, currently, right, like Pakistan and India. We'll all remember that uh, right after World War II, NATO was formed with two principles in mind. One was to push the Soviet Union back to its own borders, and uh, the second was to uh, create military units in each NATO country that would be able to put down uh, uprisings or revolutions in other countries so that the native military wouldn't have to put down their own people. Um, and with, with the dissolution or impending dissolution of NATO, uh, we're, we're throwing Europe into uh, the Soviet Union, into, the, into Russia's hands. And, um, leaving us with no frontier buffer it's gone no, you've raised several good points and i'll, I'll be brief in my response because i know people want to say something um, george w bush you know after the uh, nato summit in 2004 where as i mentioned you know, seven countries and all in eastern europe joined nato at the same time at the end of the cold war 1991 there were only 16 members of nato uh, ten years, uh, they started inducting new members, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic in 1999. By a decade later, they've got 12 new members. That's a 75% increase in NATO in ten years. And, you know, a couple of small Balkans countries, Montenegro came in, uh, Macedonia came in next because uh, the name change has been effective. Right? But uh, what that means is, and uh, George W. Bush, shortly after the 2004 uh, summit, said, uh, where's the effect that uh, he was standing, pre the sitting president at the time, uh, uh, the Warsaw Pact has now become NATO, in fact, right? I mean, the entire Warsaw Pact, uh, minus Russia now, uh, is, is now part of NATO, and they moved the border. Now, this, uh, and thanks for catching me on this earlier, Peter. Uh, the um, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty is so vital because, to, well, while there was a, war, a Warsaw Pact, there were several hundred miles of buffer zone 
between uh, you know, U.S. military hardware personnel, say, in West Germany and Russia. Now there's no buffer. So if you, you know, the internet, the uh, INF treaty covers, I think, 500 to 1,500, 500 to 5,000 kilometers. So now if you have a U.S. nuclear-tipped cruise missile in Poland or Lithuania, it hits, it hits uh, I was going to say Leningrad because of this current thing, it hits St. Petersburg or Moscow within like five, ten minutes. I mean, it's all dangerous. We have, you know, there is no buffer, as you said. And I think that's critically important right now. That's why it's more dangerous. Against my better judgment, I'm going to add to that. That means that there's no time for anyone in the Soviet Union to decide whether this is for real or not. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, you'll, you'll pardon the link, but I want to go back. Uh, I, I've got a, a point to all this. I, I want to go back a century to one of the last great conspiracy, the, the great one of the great conspiracy theories that's not talked about enough here, and that was the, the stabbed in the back theory of World War One, that uh, Germany actually didn't lose the war; they were betrayed by elements at home, and et cetera, et cetera. And after World War Two, the idea was that everyone was a victim of Nazism, and there were no perpetrators only victims. And actually, for my money, actually, that makes as much sense as anything if you're a German person and you're trying to uh, survive as, a, as, a, as an emotional human after World War II. But what I want to point out is that the great thing about those theories, and also the great thing about the Russia having stolen the election theory, is that it lets people completely off the hook. We live in a time where personal responsibility is the is the uh, uh, is in the realm of the uh, conservatives allegedly, and with the Russia with the R Russian uh, uh, subversion of the American election, uh, everyone's off the hook. Facebook's off the hook. Democrats are off the hook. The people who stand in the way of uh, election reform, where we have real elections that can be counted, they're off the hook. Everybody's off the hook. From what I understand, John Podesta, who's the who's often shown as number one in terms of the uh, people who got their emails hacked among the uh, high Democrats, allegedly his password was password. <laughs> but he's off the hook because of the Russian bots and the Russian spies and that sort of thing. And I'm very sensitive for reasons I, I'm not quite quite clear on. That, 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 and let's not forget, I want to add one more. After Trump leaves office, he's going to be off, my prediction is he's going to be off the scene. He's going to be forgotten about as quickly as humanly possible. Because having him around is going to remind people that someone voted for him and then after they voted, for, that someone didn't work very hard to defeat him. And after that, a whole bunch of people enabled uh, his, not only his craziness, they rode him like a horse to get their uh, right-wing uh, conservative uh, uh, agenda passed. And they're off the hook. So uh, they'll be off the hook when uh, he's gone. I guess my favorite story is that uh, Harris took a poll in the summer of 1974 after Richard Nixon was so uh, was so wrongly hounded from office by the press, and they asked Americans, they asked them, you know, point blank in, in anonymous surveys that are more or less, you know, not too different than the standardized uh, tests where you fill in a little a little bubble with your pencil. They asked them anonymously, "Who'd you vote for in the last election?" And so many people reported that they voted for McGovern that he would have won by a landslide. <laughs> that the people couldn't admit to having voted for Nixon because he turned out to be such a disappointment for everyone. And then no one was responsible. You know, no one voted for him. Just like no one voted, we'll, we'll see no one voted for Trump. No one uh, enabled the uh, conservative uh, uh, agenda that was put in and nobody uh, ran a bad campaign against him. So my big deal is that uh, empires need enemies more than they need friends. Uh, and the, this whole new Cold War, to me, 
uh, sir, its greatest purpose for existing is to keep the, the, the status quo and power here at home, just like the last Cold War. And uh, the, it, it's looking like, you know, since we need enemies so badly, it's looking like Islamic fundamentalism just isn't cutting it when it comes to the enemies anymore. We need something bigger. And of course, the, as you pointed out uh, so clearly, and I, and I have to thank you for your talk, that was really great, uh, the stakes are, are, are fi far higher than uh, when people were afraid that you know, I might go out and I might get killed by an Islamic terrorist. We don't have to go into how right-wing uh, uh, white supremacist terror is far more common in this country in terms of the, the body count than uh, Islamic terrorism, but we'll leave that for uh, another program or something. I just want to hit hard on this idea that, you know, uh, it's not the, 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 on the international stage, what do we really need Russia to not do? in order to uh, put forward uh, uh, U.S. interests, which I you know, would identify as capitalist interests. And I'm not so clear on that, but I'm definitely clear on how important it is to be able to point at someone and say that they're Russian, like it was important 60, 70 years ago. And with that, I guess I'll have to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, first of all, for raising a very interesting question about the arms race, and I was negligent for not um, mentioning that. Uh, we have to know that uh, you know, Russia has 155 million people. We have 330, 340. They're a small and shrinking country. Their military budget in US dollars is about 60 billion a year. It's been going down. Our new uh, National Defense Authorization Act uh, stipulate, or, uh, uh, budgets $733 billion for next year. That is more than 12 times what Russia spends. So there's no equivalence here. They're not a military threat to, uh, to us by any stretch of the imagination. I think that's important to realize. Uh, the other thing is, um, I did want to mention, because it's become, uh, it, it's uh, repeatedly cited by uh, Stephen Cohen again, that um, he's, he characterizes by saying the current situation and the worsening of uh, U.S.-Russia relations is worse than the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I think by common consensus the common accord, rather, uh, was the most dangerous period probably in human history. This is worse, he says, and he's not alone in saying it. Uh, I, there's a quote uh, from a magazine article by uh, two people you wouldn't expect to hear it from, by the way, uh, former Senator Sam Nunn, former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz, who state that, uh, this is a quote from recently, with the withdrawal of the uh, US and Russia from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, it says, have put the nuclear threat at its highest since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and stating the following, this is a quote for these two, the United States and Russia are now in a state of strategic instability and accident or mishap that set off a cataclysm. Not since the 1962 Russian, the Cuban Missile Crisis has a risk of direct confrontation involving the use of nuclear weapons than as high as it is now, and the bulletin of the atomic scientist you may, may know earlier this year moved the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight, which is the highest, I mean, the most dangerous it's ever been. Okay. A, a couple of points for you to address. Uh, William Appleman Williams in his Making of America Imperialism, whatever, uh, addresses the long standing, going back to the 1800s, animosity towards Russia's wealth, even under the Tsar and uh, its inaccessibility to U.S. capital, predating the revolution and uh, U.S. interests in gaining access to it. Um, William Binney, the uh, former NASA uh, chief scientist, uh, has scientifically proven that uh, the emails of Hillary Clinton were not hacked from overseas. That information is offered to the U.S. press uh, repeatedly and ignored uh, for them to, to publish and test uh, if they wanted to get to uh, the facts. Um, the last point is that uh, Vladimir Putin, in a number of public statements at various annual conventions, has referred to their understanding of what the U.S. is doing. 
making war in the Middle East, attacking, uh, it's attacking countries that are unable to resist, and uh, referred to the U.S. Uh, indirectly as the wolf at the door, and that they understood and they would resist. They took themselves off no first use status recently, in the last couple of years, and have explained that because of the proximity of the missiles and the, the war college talk about usable nuclear weapons, uh, we, the, the economics of having weapons so fantastically invested in that uh, they should be used, the uh, technological development of the, the uh, 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 scalable nuclear weapons and steerable nuclear weapons, the, what is it, B-21 gravity bomb? Or 61. 61. That uh, Boeing is helping to uh, create. Uh, it makes sense. Nuclear war could be green, even, with their deep penetration. And they constantly talk about, in, at the war colleges, the uh, ability to decapitate Russia. And suddenly, everybody else in the population decapitate the leadership. Everybody else in the, uh, the country would welcome Americans with open arms. I wonder if you might address some of some of that. It is dangerous, and we're likely to be caught off guard as a result of uh, the American press being totally at the uh, beck and call of the financial class. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are several missile uh, weapons programs, and this, these go back really to the George W. Bush administration. So again, as mentioned before, this is incremental uh, strategic military buildup for, and I'm glad uh, Dale alluded to it, for a potential deep strike, first strike, military attack against Russia, China, and Iran. Those are the three countries that are, that are clearly targeted by things like prompt global strike, hypersonic missiles, space planes, st uh, Star Wars, or space war, uh, the so-called anti-ballistic missile system, and so forth. I don't have time to go into all of these, because they're being developed at the same time. I might mention, as a, a little bit of vanity, that a decade ago I wrote a fairly extensive article about prompt global strike that Fidel Castro, in the goodness of his heart, decided to uh, pick up and, and republish, you know, under, with his commentary. Uh, he, at least, I think, you know, saw what that meant, because along the lines of what Dale was saying, uh, if you can develop deep, penetrating, super stealthy planes that can go right into the interior of Russia and China undetected, and if you can fire the prompt global strike, which is allowing the U.S. to deliver a missile strike within 60 minutes to any point on the Earth, to go down to less than a minute, according to military officials that I've seen cited to that effect, then what it does is this. It, it, what Peter was saying, it puts the tripwire so delicate that any time you see something on the radar screen, if you're smart, you're going to hit back because you fear there's a second round of missiles coming if you don't knock them up. What I'm particularly concerned about, though, in Eastern Europe, and I'll be brief on this, is that uh, starting in 2009, uh, the George W. Bush administration was going to put missiles in uh, Romania and a missile radar site in the Czech Republic. It was what's called a uh, ground-based mid-course uh, interception, missile intercept. The uh, Obama administration, Hillary Clinton, uh, switched that to what's called the uh, uh, European phase adaptive approach. That's why they're ballistic missiles in Romania now, next year going to be in Poland. There is no, I mean, uh, does Russia trust them that these are simply, to use their terminology, kinetic hit to kill missiles with no payload on them? Uh, you know, before or after Moscow was uh, wiped off the face of the map, you know, at what point do you, do you trust that this is simply what they stated? So this is a level of danger we're talking about. New weapon systems, instantaneous. Cyber warfare and space warfare alone should terrify us. Because what that uh, permits the US and its allies to do is this uh, absolutely close down you know, communication control, computer, and so forth uh, networks for the military of another country, rendering that country absolutely in the computer age uh, defenseless. Looking back into the uh, uh, 1960s, we'll all remember how brave uh, President Kennedy was in facing down the Russians 
over the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, it was reported only several years later that the negotiations for the removal of the Russian missile from Cuba was the removal of 1,500 medium-range missiles from the border of the Soviet Union Turkey, that were in Turkey. Turkey. That were about to be retired anyway. Yes. Thank you. I would like to take a moment to, to tell a short anecdote, and you can leave this off of the uh, YouTube. It'll be there. It'll be there. I worked for Werner von Braun in Huntsville, Alabama uh, in the 1950s and through 1962. Um, von Braun had developed the V-2 missile at the request of Hitler at the order of Hitler. And uh, when he received the commission, he wrote to the United States um, government printing office. And for 85 cents, he obtained all of the research that was done by Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Robert Oppenheimer. No, no. Missile, uh, liquid fueled missiles. Could have been in aerospace. Oh, God. In Goddard. 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 And uh, his first attempt was simply a scaled up model of that. And I would like to continue my analogy. When uh, Hitler, when uh, von Braun told us this, he, when he perceived that the Russians were moving very, very rapidly across northern Europe, into what is Panamunda, the German Missile Research Center. Um, he and his 80-man team um, commandeered a passenger train and took it down into Austria, where they surrendered to an advance American troop uh, on one condition, that they tell Eisenhower, who was the commander of the European forces, uh, who von Braun was. Von Braun knew exactly who he was. Um, and they then moved the entire team from Austria. They couldn't bring them into the United States because there's a law on the book which is still there. Uh, if you belong to the Nazi party, you can't enter the United States. So the army moved the whole team down to Mexico City for 18 months and then brought them up through El Paso as Mexican immigrants and establish them in Huntsville, Alabama. What a fascinating uh, uh, revelation. Uh, we would have gone to our graves not knowing that story had been good enough to share it. Uh, I should you know, suggest in Huntsville, Alabama, where Von Braun was, uh, at, with the U.S. Missile Defense Agency, it's been reported, this years ago, that if you go into the director's office, there's a reproduction of Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative speech. So all this talk about the missiles going on Russia's border not being a Star Wars, not being a miss this is exactly what it is, and they acknowledge it to be so. This is the son of Star Wars. Is that it? it? Anyone else? Okay, well thank you, Rick. Thank you very much.